Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine, featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Medicine and the Machine with my co-host, Eric Topol. Uh, we are delighted today to have a guest who really has a wonderful perspective on American healthcare, somebody that I've known for some time now, um, uh, that is Dr. Robert Pearl. Uh, Robbie is the former CEO of the Permanente Medical Group. Uh, so in that, in that role, he really led 10,000 physicians and 38,000 staff and really transformed, uh, transformed that Mid-Atlantic Permanente Group. I could tell and I could see that happening. Uh, he serves as a clinical professor of plastic surgery at Stanford University, and he's also on the faculty of the Graduate School of Business, where I had the great pleasure of uh, sitting in on one of his classes and understood healthcare for the first time, uh, I think. <laughs> he's the author of the book, Mistreated, Why We Think We're Getting Good Healthcare and Why We're Usually Wrong. But today we're actually here to talk with him about his new book, Uncaring, How the Culture of Medicine kills doctors and patients. Now, Robbie writes regularly for Forbes. He writes in many other venues. He's often sought out as a commentator and he has his own podcast. Uh, Robbie, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you to our podcast. Thank you so much for being with us today. Abraham and Eric, it is my privilege and my pleasure to be here today. I look forward to our conversation. You know, I want to start off by asking you, you know, of all the things that you could have chosen to write about, uh, you've chosen to write about the culture of medicine. I find that quite intriguing. And the book really covers so many things, but at, at its root is really, it's about us. It's about the culture of medicine. And for our readers, perhaps you can sort of tell us how you embarked on this. What, what made this happen? So in 2017, I published the book, Mistreated, why we think we're getting good health care, why we're usually wrong. All the profits from that book and this new one go to Doctors Without Borders. And I spoke in that book about all the systemic issues, the problems with insurance companies, drug companies, hospital consolidations. I spoke about the systemic issues as I went around the country speaking at events, talking to different organizations, something was missing because people have talked about many of these same things, moving from FIFA service to capitation and fragmentation to integration and technology left over from the 20th century, although really it's the 19th century, it's the fax machine from 1834 uh, for a long time. And yet so little changed, Abraham. And I asked myself, what might we be missing? And as I spoke with individuals and did research it was this invisible force, as powerful as gravity and visible only through its impact on others that led me to conclude that there was this second piece, this culture of medicine, the physician culture. I see it like the caduceus, that symbol that doctors wear in the white coats and on book covers of the two snakes wrapped around the staff, one snake being the systemic problems and one being the cultural ones. And it's impossible to separate them apart. And what I realize is that going to make American medicine once again what it should be, we're going to have to address both issues, both the systemic and the cultural. And that led to the book and led to the conversations that I've been having with uh, various audiences across the United States today. You know, the culture can actually be an impediment to progress. I mean, I was intrigued by some of your historical examples, uh, Semmelweis, you know, made this groundbreaking discovery that dipping your hands in lime of carbolic could prevent purple sepsis, which was killing one in five women in the organ minor Kranken hospital in Vienna. And yet it took, uh, I think, 150 years or something before that was implemented because physician culture was resisting it. And it makes me wonder, what, what is our physician culture resisting now that that really we should be embracing? Uh, is, it fee for, is it abandoning fee for service? What is it that we're not doing now that we should be doing that our culture resists? 
first thing I want to say is we have a wonderful culture and you've written about it so brilliantly across time. And we have to make sure that as we try to address both the systemic and the cultural issues, we don't lose the amazing parts. You know, you had physicians early in the coronavirus pandemic going in 12 and 24 hours a day to take care of patients without the protective gear they needed, you know, donning garbage uh, bags in place of gowns and salad lids in place of N95 masks. You know, they passed tubes into patients' lungs, knowing that every time that tube went through the vocal cords, patients would cough, spewing virus in their face, and they did it anyway. And that is the positive sides that came out of it. You know, Abraham, I sat in on one of your lectures where you talked about that iconic painting, The Doctor, and the grief that that individual felt, the empathy he showed, the caring, the attentiveness. But over the course of time, in order to be able to do that, in order to take care of patients with COVID-19, the culture has had denial and repression. We learn that emotions get in the way. Uh, we taught in residency, never admit you're in pain. Never say that you're tired. We'd work for you know, 100 hours. You know, now, now residents can work only 80 hours. I mean, it's amazing to think about that, but that doesn't even count when they drive there and drive back and study at night for the cases the next day. So we have a culture that has this denial and this repression. And it allows us to do remarkable things. I write the book, as you know, about my cousin, Alan, who had uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and got treated at Stanford. And the doctors there being by his side, watching him vomit across entire weekends. They, were, they didn't desert him, but they couldn't feel his pain because of this denial and repression. But they needed that to save the lives of children today, the advances that are there. So that's what we see. We don't see the role Physicians don't see <clears throat> the many ways that they contribute to the problem. They see the systemic ones, and those are very real, Abraham. Our doctors today are working incredibly hard, and there are problems trying to navigate the system and bureaucratic issues and computers that get in the way, but they can't see as well as we need to the ways that we contribute to 30% of things we do that the Mayo Clinic showed add no value. The uh, issues of chronic disease and prevention, where we elevate status, esteem, respect. These are the cultural issues that we elevate above other things without being aware that we are doing it. Racism to me is a great example. You know, if you ask doctors why in the COVID-19 pandemic did black patients die three times more often than white patients, they'll point out the systemic issues. Black patients often work jobs that they couldn't work from home. They had to go into the workplace site, taking buses and subways, living, multi, living in multi-generational homes. But it doesn't explain why early in the pandemic, when two patients came to the ED, both with exactly the same symptoms, a white patient and a black patient, we tested the white patient twice as often with a 40% lower um, a degree of medication that we administer to black patients than white patients after the same procedure. And obviously both of you read the New England Journal of Medicine, where recently we looked at the scenarios of patients with chest pain and patients who are, white, who are perceived to be white patients based upon these scenarios that are given to doctors. They got tested and treated more often than the white patients, despite the fact that they had exactly the same symptoms in the research studies that were done. So it's this culture that values things that don't necessarily make sense. You know, we elevate uh, certain parts left over from the last century. How do we admit and test medical students? We do it based upon memorization of arcane facts. Those are the tests that we give them. Why do they burn out in the first year of medical school? Because we are teaching them these facts. They're coming there for something that is much more important and that's what we give them. But it's a value left over, Abraham, for the 20th century. Because in the 20th century, if you wanted to carry around the totality of medical knowledge, you need a 50-pound backpack. Today, we call it a smartphone. Why do we ever have someone in medical school take a test without insisting they bring their smartphone? 
because that is how the, that's the tool they're going to have in the exam room along with them. And why don't we focus on the types of things that you've encouraged? How do we express the empathy, relate to the family, be able to make the changes that are needed? It's the culture, I believe, that gets in the way. And it's what I think needs to change if we're going to change the system and improve healthcare. Well, one thing I wonder about, Ravi, is this uh, separation of uh, and uncaring uh, that you have the systemic features that you've reviewed, and then you have some that are, of course, separate from that. But the interdependence or the the intertwining between these uh, is hard to dissect. So, uh, I think most of us who go on to medicine uh, want to care for patients, but that's interrupted. And it's uh, you know blocked in many respects because of the way medicine has uh, moved on. That is, whether it's the reliance on becoming data clerks, whether it's the lack of time with patients, as Abraham has so duly emphasized, the real presence with patients to engender their trust and be able to express the empathy. Um, so how do you how do you you know sort these out? How do you try to make distinctions between what's embedded versus what's um, basically influenced by the way medicine has become a big business. Well, it is this entwining of the snakes. And to me, a really great example has to do with the economics of healthcare. And in the culture of medicine, we are taught that dollars should not be significant and we shouldn't discuss them with patients. Sometimes we have to, but we shouldn't discuss it with them. The reality is that patients are suffering. They can't afford the cost of healthcare. And we have not really taken that on from my viewpoint uh, as a specialty, as a profession, being able to figure out how can we do the best things for our patients. You know, Eric, a lot of this book came out of December, 2019. This was two months before the coronavirus comes ashore. The federal government releases data that says healthcare is going to go up five to six percent a year for the next decade every single year. When you compound the numbers, it's a 70 percent increase. We're going to go from 3.7 trillion to 6.2 trillion dollars, 2.5 trillion more dollars. I mean, we, think about the things we could do with that money in terms of preventing disease, managing chronic disease, education of patients, social determinants of health. We can go on the entire list, moving technology available to every American to improve their health care. I waited for every organization in American medicine to step forward and say, this is ridiculous. Because the assumption underlying it is that nothing was going to improve about how efficient and effective healthcare could be because the assumption in the culture is that this is as good as it gets, despite the fact of all the data saying we lag the other industrialized nations, last in life expectancy, last in childhood mortality, last in maternal mortality. It doesn't matter. The culture sees what we're doing as being the right and appropriate way. And so no one, there was not a single organization in medicine that spoke out and said, this is absurd. We've got to figure out the ways to do that. And that's, you're absolutely right. This is the intertwining of those two. You know, one of the things that always impresses me about you, Eric, is your patience about how slowly America is embracing mm -hmm. the technology mm -hmm. that's possible. I don't know how you have that patience to not be screaming about the opportunities that are lost. But if we step back and look at that and ask why, why, you know, seven years ago, I wrote a piece in Health Affairs where I pointed out the opportunities through telemedicine. At that time, we were doing 12 million virtual visits in Kaiser Permanente. I predicted that 30% of what we did in the office, we'd be able to use, do it a better way, using te um, video, tele telemedicine, video. And I waited. And for six years, not a single thing changed. And suddenly, the coronavirus comes ashore, and all of a sudden, 60, 70% of practices are embracing this there wasn't any improvement in the technology. There wasn't any change in the practice of medicine. How do we explain this? It's purely gonna be, well, not many, purely, it's mainly cultural, although some of the changes at the federal level, allowing interstate use of telemedicine and some of the issues around Medicare reimbursement existed as well. But all of a sudden, the threat to physicians and to their staff 
made us close our offices and telemedicine became a boon. Now, to me, what's really interesting in it, and it's an area that you focus on all the time, is listening to the doctors talk about telemedicine. And how do they describe it? They describe it as an inferior method of providing care com compared to having the patient come to our office. Wait a second. Telemedicine allows immediate diagnosis more conveniently. Higher patient satisfaction, by the way, than seeing the same doctor in the office, 10% higher at a far lower cost or potentially lower cost of care delivery. Why should we not be elevating this and finding out ways to do it? Because it diminishes what we value inside the medical profession, which is our office. You know, what do we call that space inside the front door? We call it a waiting room. I'm sure Abraham has measures of stories from other places in the world where you go in there and you wait on the royalty. That's not how we think of ourselves. I wanna be really clear to make sure physicians understand that, but that's the culture that we've inherited. The question we should be asking is, how do we eliminate offices? the way other uh, organizations, industries are doing today in the post-coronavirus era. Asking ourselves, how do we get rid of hospitals? These are the kinds of questions we need to be asking ourselves, but the culture is going to make that very difficult. And as you say, these two snakes intertwine, the system, systemic problems and the cultural ones. We've got to address both of them. If we try to address only one, we're gonna get our hand bitten by the other serpent. Medicine and the Machine will be right back. Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine, featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com. You do a, a wonderful job of laying out the history of American medicine and its funding, um, you know, beginning with, I mean, going way back. And at every stage of the game, uh, the, the physician lobby, the, physician, the body of physicians resisted anything that took away fee for service. And so the reason we're at this impasse right now has a lot to do with us. And in, in other words, all our lobbying organizations weren't lobbying for the patient's welfare or for the cost of healthcare. They were lobbying for our pockets. I think what I found most astonishing was one paragraph in your book where you quote a study that I was not aware of from 94, that the more specialists there are in a particular area, the higher the mortality. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Or the higher the expenses, higher the... No, the mortality. Um, mortality, okay. <laughs> there, so, there, 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 are, there are two sets of studies. And they're separated by two decades. One recently done, as you know, by your colleagues at Stanford, along with some colleagues from the Harvard Medical School, uh, where adding 10 primary care physicians to a community increases longevity two and a half times more than adding 10 specialists. The study you're quoting, actually, the specialty addition actually lowered the uh, outcomes and Eric's very familiar with some research that was done that looked at the question of what happens when cardiologists go to national meetings. And the answer is actually that the uh, survival goes up, not down as a consequence of having fewer specialists there. Now, again, I wanna make sure that listeners don't overinterpret what I'm saying. Specialists do a remarkable, great job. The question we have to look at is at that edge, that 30% of things that add no value, not only do they raise costs, that's what you're saying, but theoretically and potentially they create more problems and they actually shorten life rather than extending it. Yeah, I think you're bringing up an important point there, Robbie, in that we know, as you already mentioned, that the outcomes in the U.S. are inferior to other countries. In fact, all OECD countries, which is remarkable considering we're at least double, if not quadruple, in terms of our percent GDP expenditures. But most people think that's just because of the lack of access, the lack of uh, having even distribution of care. But you and many others uh, and the studies that you're citing have pointed out that some of that excess, some of the poor outcomes is due to doing too much. The incidental omas, the chasing down rabbit holes of things and people getting hurt because of that, and no less the cost. So. 
you know, one of the things that, of course, comes up out of this is the solution. What do we do? Now, Zeke Emanuel, he wrote a book rating 13 countries' healthcare systems, which I reviewed for Nature. And he basically, the U.S. was the worst. Uh, you could say China was close, but in his view, book, but the U.S., considering it's how much it spends, was clearly the worst. And um, he basically came up with the conclusion that the main reason is universal health care is absent here. And also, I, I want to get your response about that. But, you know, when I was involved with the UK review of the NHS, there was no reluctance to embrace technology such that my hospitals might get gutted by remote monitoring. Whereas here, that's the top item of our expenditures, which are hospitals, you know, over $1 trillion a year and rising quickly. So can you tell us about your views on um, universal health care and whether that's a remedy and what other possible solutions you might come up with for the problem? Well, once, once again, Eric, the, this problem is this two-headed snake. The systemic problems are there. If you don't have health care coverage, you can't get excellent care. If you're in a situation of a uh, problem in your life where you can't get to the doctor because of transportation issues or cost issues, you can't get great care. So that's the bare minimum. And we need to do that. And we're one of the few nations in the world that don't have universal coverage sitting in place. But I also worry that uh, that's not going to be enough because of this culture. Culture is what you value, your beliefs, the norms you follow. You know, it, it comes through language and it comes through stories that are handed down from generation to generation. I believe that actually we have an opportunity coming out of the coronavirus. In the post-coronavirus era, I'm going to predict, and I'm very well aware that making economic predictions is a very dangerous uh, job to undertake. Uh, but I think we're going to see economic problems that we don't really fully understand and anticipate because the stock markets are doing well. But the federal government's already borrowed $8 trillion that it has to pay back with interest. States by law have to have balanced budgets. And even California with Netflix and Google and Facebook, it's facing problems as the unemployment rate continues to be high and as the um, cost of Medicaid continues to grow, and small businesses. I mean, these are the engines of employment. Most jobs are not in these big companies. They're actually a small and medium-sized company. They've been hit really, really hard. And I think we're going to see a need to actually lower the cost of healthcare. Now, we've talked about it, as Abraham said, since 1932, but now I think it's gonna be something we can't avoid for a variety of reasons that we could in the past. And there's only two ways to lower healthcare. You know, I think our nation has to accept the fact that fee-for-service will never lower healthcare because if you drop prices, utilization is gonna go up. And that process of being able to incent people to do more will always lead to more getting done. You can do it by rationing. Say someone's too old for surgery, uh, the drug's too expensive to provide, uh, co companies, uh, countries do that. Some, some countries do, particularly the ones that have lower socioeconomics, or you can transform medicine. And that's where I think it's going to go, Eric. I, I think the, the step will be capitation. And capitation is something I personally believe in because it aligns the interests of doctors and patients, but it also evolves the culture. And by capitation, I want to be really clear. This is not capitation of insurance companies. This is at the delivery system level. So when a group of physicians are brought together with a hospital and with a total budget to take care of a population of patients, they start to think differently and culture evolves. Prevention becomes as important as intervention. Avoidance of complications from chronic disease become as important as managing the complications of the chronic disease. Patient safety, avoidance of medical error, Embracing the technology that's going to improve performance, technology like telemedicine or technology, not just of monitoring, but monitoring integrated with care delivery in a way to actually impact uh, chronic disease in a more positive way. They even could start embracing artificial intelligence in all of the areas that you've pushed for so hard across time, it starts to evolve. Primary care, you start to elevate the status of primary care in a capitated type 
organization. And I think it's going to happen. And actually, I have a little bit of worry because as it happens, I think physicians that experience Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. You know, early on, in fact, we're already seeing it somewhat. You, they're going to start denying what's going on. Then they get angry that somehow we're not being heard, we're not being listened to, no one cares about it, our pain. Then they're going to go into bargaining. You're seeing this already as more than half of physicians now are employed by hospitals. Depression, we're seeing it in the burnout, we're seeing it in the suicide. And I think ultimately it's getting to acceptance. And my hope is that in getting to acceptance, people will, uh, physicians will come to understand that it's nothing they did, it's the change in the world around them. When patients come to our offices with printouts from Google, we may say this is terrible medicine, but that's the existence, that's, that's what life is like now. Patients are more uh, consumers they want better service, more convenient service. And in healthcare, we've said, no, we're just not going to provide that to the level that uh, patients get in retail and get in uh, travel. So I think that that's where we're going to evolve to. And I'm hoping, Eric, that that's where the cultural change is going to happen. Not because anyone says to make it happen, but when that happens, now you're still going to start to see the 30% of the things that we do that had no value disappearing. I think you're going to see costs, theoretically at least, potentially becoming ameliorated. And I think that we as physicians can benefit through that process in a way that's going to allow us to not only have a better professional practice, but a diminution in burnout and psychological anxiety and depression. You know, the last part of this uh, conversation, uh, Robbie, I want to talk about what I think is going to be the thing people remember most about physician culture in this particular era, and that is burnout. We've never had more people burnout, never had more attrition, never had more people disillusioned, paradoxically, with more students coming in than ever because of COVID. So, But uh, I think uh, you've done a great job of discussing burnout in this book, and I learned a lot. Uh, tell us your perspective on physician burnout, what it is, what we can do to address it, and what the future might hold. Burnout is a terrible problem. And as you say, it's becoming more prevalent. You know, again, I think back to that painting, the doctor that you lecture on so brilliantly, and I talk about it in my book. This should be the golden age of medicine. I mean, we now have the science that we didn't even have in the last uh, century, in the latter part of the last century to understand cardiovascular disease. Eric's followed this across his career. You know, we, we basically know how to diminish it to a huge extent that was not possible in the past. And we're seeing organizations that are able to uh, lower mortality by 40, 50% to make it not even the number one cause of death amongst populations. Uh, we now have technology that we couldn't even imagine. I mean, you think about the smartphone, that was the 2007 introduction and how much knowledge and information we carry with us all the time, treatments that we can offer. And yet, as you say, rather than being the golden age, it's a time of, uh, of burnout. And I think this is a very much a combination of the systemic and the cultural pieces. Ask doctors about the cause and they're gonna give you three big reasons. First, they don't get paid enough, which means they have to see too many patients. Second, there's all these bureaucratic tasks, particularly prior authorization. And then there's the electronic health record that literally gets between them and the patient. And all three of these are valid. And again, they do contribute very uh, significantly, but they don't explain a lot of the variation that you see inside the data that I, I think comes into the challenges of burnout and the solutions that need to go into place. Part of it, let's say, is around, or part of it is around the hierarchy of medicine. So if you look at the data, what you see is that the specialty prior to COVID that was most burned out was urology. Now, if urologists earn close to half a million dollars a year, they make double what pediatricians make and yet they're almost 10 points more burned out. So if it's just a question of how much money we make or how many patients we see, 
you can't explain urology being the most burned out specialty as a consequence of that. And if you look at the other end, what specialties have very low rates? You look at orthopedics, ophthalmology, 25 points lower than urology. They have to go through the same bureaucratic tasks. They have to get the same authorization. They have to use the same computer systems. So, so none of the things that we point to fully explain the variation inside the data set that's there. And that's why, again, I come to the conclusion, it's not an either or, it's a both. And we have to address the culture. But how do we explain urology? Go back to 2010, urologists actually had very low rates of burnout. They were sort of similar to the orthopedists and to the ophthalmologists that were there. And then 2012, the National Preventive Healthcare Service Task Force says that PSA, the number one, uh, de de driver, the number one driver of uh, what will become uh, a prostatectomy, uh, isn't a particularly good test that actually creates more problems than it solves. And so primary care physicians stop ordering the uh, PSA. And then we have evidence that watchful waiting is just as good as intervention for a significant number of tumors. So the number of cases go down. And then we have centers of excellence to where patients who are now become more educated through the internet are likely to go. And the end result is that most urologists are doing far fewer prostatectomies and some are losing privileges. Now, why should this be such a driver of this unhappiness? Because if you look at the salaries across that time, urology has stayed to be one of the most remunerative uh, specialties in the nation. The answer is because in the culture of medicine, our status is dependent upon how technically sophisticated and advanced we are. And in urology, that big driver was the robotic prostatectomy the Star Wars type procedure. And as doctors had fewer opportunities to do this, the status starts to drop. So Michael Marmot, who you know, has talked about what happens relative to status and esteem in hierarchy. It's equally important to income. And when it drops, researchers have shown that it produces fatigue, lack of fulfillment and dissatisfaction, exactly these symptoms of burnout. It makes no sense. In the minds of doctors, the problem with primary care is they're not paid enough and that's why they have lower status. The literature would say, no, they have lower status because what they do is not as interventional, not as high tech machine, multi-million dollar machine driven. And that's why they end up earning less money and particularly as evidence-based medicine comes along. And now it's less about your deductive skills that are there. And you put on top of that, some of the technology around diagnosis. And you, you've, <laughs> you're the world's expert about this, the importance of that physical examination. But as it becomes less significant, all of a sudden the entire role of primary care starts to drop and the burnout that's there is contributed by these external forces, by these insurance companies, by the computer systems, by the amount of time that it takes to enter that data, more than as much time billing and documenting as care delivery, but it's also for the things inside the healthcare profession, things that we can uh, change. The last thing I wanna say though, is that if you look at the data in burnout in the past two years, there's a shift. Now the most burned out specialty, critical care medicine. Now, why should critical care medicine become suddenly the most burned out specialty? And the answer of course is COVID-19. Some of which is the fact they've been called on to work extended long hours, but some of it also is encountering the futility of their actions the impotence to be able to save a human life. You know, we take an oath first, do no harm and save a life at any cost. And there they are not able to accomplish all of that in a culture that has repression and denial and teaches people not to deal with their emotions. I talked to one Dr. Abraham, he said he lost four patients in a day. I talked to a resident who started this service with six patients in the critical care unit, all dead by the end of the month. How do you deal with that? except by repression and denial. You know, the doctor and that painting that you talk about so well, 
He didn't have death every day. That repression denial allowed him to have the empathy, to be able to have that presence, to go on and practice, and to have the elevated esteem. But today, it's very different. I'm, it's very different, and I'm very worried. I'm very worried that we're going to see PTSD. That at the end of this process, and that's what we learned from the military, it doesn't happen on the battlefield. It happens afterwards. And we're going to have a huge, an entire generation of physicians who are going to be having these symptoms, not able to talk about them, not able to see them, say they need psychological help. And we're going to see actually the problems get much worse. And I have written about it, and I'm encouraging every residency director, every hospital director to make sure that we create the environment that is safe, where people can talk about their feelings, admit the pain that they're suffering and make sure they can get in a very confidential type of way, the psychological support that they need. You're absolutely right. Burnout is a symptom of how broken things are. What's broken is both the system of medicine and the culture. Yeah, I mean, I, but I would just question that, Robbie, because we're, you know, the three of us are the old dogs here and we were practicing medicine uh, 30 years ago, there was no burnout. Then people were happy to be a physician, loved caring for patients. There were no robots. Okay. There was no special status and the culture is the same. In fact, as you point out aptly, the culture hasn't changed and it has a lot of what you said, repression and, and all this other stuff. So what has changed, what has made this burnout a global crisis, which wasn't the case decades ago, what, what accounts for that? It, it, I, I have a hard time thinking it's the culture, but it's the systemic factors I think that you've emphasized. Would you agree with that? What, what's changed is not the culture. That's one yeah. of the issues. We still have the culture of 20 years ago, which changed is the society. Mm. So when you were in your training, your, when you were in Cleveland Clinic and you told the patient what to do, the patient looked at you and said, yes, sir. That's different today. I never so that did is, that. I never I did that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying is that, is that this, the patriarchal way that we provided care, the way the physician was held in that high level of esteem, because we had all the knowledge, you know, for, for someone to try to understand something about a complex disease, they'd have to go to the medical library, pull out volumes of books. Now they go online and they have the information very quickly. And again, we may say it's not great information, but that's not so, their mind. So you mean as control freaks, we lost the control and that's accounting for the problem? Is that what you're getting at? I think we've lost some of our position in the hierarchy and we're struggling with that. And we're blaming that on the insurers. We're blaming that on the system. And we're not recognizing is not that we are making it happen, but that we have not been able to take the lead at making the change happen. You know, we said you, you said earlier about the fact that the organizations that are resisting it are inside the profession and that the organizations that represent us and they wouldn't be doing it if it's not what we wanted them to be doing. You know, I think about burnout. We've been talking about this for five years and nothing's changed in terms of the systemic reactions, the insurance companies, the, the bureaucratic tasks, the, the computer system. Do we think we're just not yelling loud enough? Is that the problem? No. The problem is that we are going to have to take the lead at making this evolution and this change happen. We're going to have to acknowledge some of the things. Opioid epidemic, as an example. You know, if you ask doctors about it, it was the drug company problem. And the drug companies were terrible telling us that patients wouldn't die, they wouldn't get addicted. But we still wrote the prescriptions. And we continued to write those prescriptions even when we had started to have that knowledge existing. Look at another example, um, billing that surprise billing, out of network billing. One in five patients who come to the ED in the United States today or go to the operating room have a surprise bill. It's often sent by the hospital, but it's sent for the actions that we do. How do we justify that? I mean, that's like the countries that put civilians near military sites on the hope that the enemy is not going to attack them. But when they do, 
It's collateral damage. That's how it's defined in the cultures that are there. You know, we see it as something we've got to do to protect patients against insurance companies. No, that's not what's going on at all. And I understand, again, the systemic pieces. I want us to make sure listeners are understanding. It's both, but it's what we do and we don't notice it. We mentioned earlier the racism that exists chronic disease. Across the United States today, we control hypertension 55 to 60% of the time. Number one cause of strokes, major contributor to heart disease, major contributor to kidney failure. When I was the CEO in Kaiser Permanente, we did it 90% of the time. I mean, our docs were good, but your docs and Abraham's docs and all of our docs, they're really good too. It's not that we didn't have better doctors. We didn't have better medications. It's a culture that starts to value what is not valued in our specialty. And what I would say, Eric, is it's this imbalance between the things that we we believe is important and what the world is telling us is important. It's that imbalance that is contributing, not the sole cause. We've got to address the number of patients seen per day. It's way too many. And you've got some great ideas about how to solve it. We've got to address the bureaucratic authorization processes and all of these limitations that happen that get imposed upon us. We've got to take care of an electronic health record that my gosh is so so out of date. And the fact that we can't get comprehensive information, these are real, but we can't just expect either they're going to change. We've got to also admit, I think our role and take the lead. And if if I have a one word for people who are listening in who say, well, I'm not sure we really have to do it. The one word I'd give them is Amazon. Amazon is moving into this area in a very aggressive type of way. Three years ago when Haven was formed, which you know very well, the union of Amazon and JP uh, and Morgan Chase and uh, Berkshire Hathaway, I wrote a piece where I said that anyone who believes that Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon at the time, is doing this only for his own employees as a not-for-profit, which is what he was talking about at the time, probably believes that Amazon only sells books. No, this was going to be a major economic venture. One-sixth of retail is now Amazon. Bezos is going to want, or his CEO is going to want to make healthcare one-sixth. They're already offering telemedicine across the entire United States. They're offering in, uh, on-site care close to the facilities that they have. We know they already have pharmacies or online pharmacies and ability to provide medication across this nation. They're going to move into this space and they're not going to find the insurance company they want to contract with to provide the care. And they're not going to hire every doctor at every hospital. They are going to evolve the system. And I believe, and I love being a physician. I love the medical profession. I want us to be the ones to carry the day and move it forward, but we're going to move it forward by advancing the culture, I believe, not trying to hold on to what we inherited 20 years ago when we were in medical school and residency. The book is Uncaring by Robbie Pearl, and uh, every time I hear Robbie Pearl teach a class, I really walk away so educated. It's a wonderful perspective on medicine, and you'll find the same in the book, uh, Robbie, uh, it's just been a pleasure to have you on our on our program and uh, look forward to the things that you produce in time. So thank you so much. Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine, featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com.